I invite us to open our Bibles to Psalms chapter 1, the first chapter in the book of Psalms. I've not preached verse by verse, chapter by chapter from the book of Psalms for some time now. I believe I can state from memory that I have preached verse by verse and word for word the first 79 chapters of Psalms. And I've said eventually we'll get back in Psalms and preach the balance of the books of Psalms or the chapters in Psalms. But there's a little nugget in the first chapter that we want to talk about in just the first three verses, and we'll look at that in a moment. Some of you, especially some of you that have a military background or a, an acquaintance with military, will recognize this statement. A lot of the exams and tests and quizzes given in military, those multi-choice, multiple choice. And the general rule in military testing, when in doubt, Charlie out. <laughs> Most of you know what that means. It's A, B, C, so you select the middle. Uh, that is C, Charlie out. Select C, A, B, C, C, generally be the, uh, how would you say, the Charlie out uh, approach to take. Well, that's simply what we find in general in society today. The mindset is for students in school, whether it be in junior high or high school or sometimes beyond, it is simply do that which will get you a C average, just an average, just mediocre. Some in the realm of work, the philosophy is do the very least I can to keep the boss happy and just do that which is mediocrity and everything is all right. Just the average is okay. We find that uh, throughout society today, and it permeates the church. It uh, is part and parcel of the human DNA, and as a result of that, the philosophy is generally, I'm just simply going to do what is uh, only expected of me uh, at the least level to keep as uh, many people possible as pleased with what I'm doing, whether it be academically or socially, and I believe we fall into that category spiritually. The philosophy is, if I can memorize John 3.16 and maybe two or three other uh, key texts, uh, that's all right. If I can just uh, uh, serve the Lord occasionally, that's all right. If I can just give the crumbs from the table, uh, financially speaking, that's all right. If I can just give a small amount of my time and not be concerned about my talents and uh, testimony, being surrendered to the Lord, that's all right. It's simply living a life of mediocrity. Uh, the level of uh, acceptance from society has permeated the church and therefore multitudes in our churches today and Christians today, even among uh, churches in general, the philosophy is just skate by, just do as little as possible. Multitudes of churches today in fact, I believe I could almost say most churches, but I will not go that far, no longer have Sunday evening services. In fact, the pastors that I've heard uh, in the past several years, they said, well, this is the Charlie Out portion. Well, <laughs> you know, uh, I believe in family time, and I believe that Sunday evenings ought to be family time. Families ought to spend that time together. So we're releasing our people, one pastor said in his words. We're releasing our people so they can be with their families on Sunday evening rather than worrying about coming to church on Sunday evenings. Uh, we've found that in the last several years, the church, many churches have done that on Wednesday evenings or Tuesday or Thursdays, whenever they have normally had their midweek special services. We've always called them midweek Bible studies and prayer time. Uh, multitudes have said, let's dispense with that. Rather than recognizing the fact that we are lowering the standard and falling into the realm of greater and greater mediocrity, uh, rather than recognizing that and striving to do the best we can, striving to be the best we can, striving to reach the highest level we can in serving the Lord, we have plummeted to the lowest level of mediocrity. And that's what we're going to talk about in just a moment. But out of honor and recognition of the reading of the Word, I invite us to stand. As we stand together in Psalms, the first chapter, the whole unit of thought is uh, verses 1 through 6. We're going to take half of that, just three verses. 
You say, wow, that's unusual, preacher. It's just going to do three verses. That means we'll be out of here in 15 minutes. No, not, <laughs> not likely. But the first three verses, follow with me as I read audibly. Follow with me in your scripture silently. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Thank you so much, and we may be seated. We live in that world of ordinary people, a society of saying average is okay. We live in a time of kind of the run-of-the-mill mediocrity. It's kind of a, I don't know if you've heard this or not, kind of a run-of-the-mill, a so-so, humdrum, that's normal. I don't know how humdrum really what that connotes, but uh, uh, that's the term that we hear so often. I believe we should strive to be beyond that ordinary, especially for Christians. The happy Christian, the Christian that is rejoicing internally, is not just the ordinary, he is the extraordinary the one that makes a difference in society, the one that impacts others' lives, the ones that will stand for truth uh, even if we have to stand alone. His extraordinary. It's one thing to be an ordinary Christian, but it's another altogether to be an extraordinary Christian. And to do that, we need to go beyond mediocrity, beyond mediocrity. There are three very brief points in these three very short verses that I want to share with us. We want to see in verse number one, we're talking about the extraordinary Christian, the one that goes beyond mediocrity. He is separated from the world in that first verse. He is saturated in the word in the second verse. He is strengthened by the word in the third verse. So I want us to think for a moment about going beyond mediocrity, how to be an extraordinary Christian. And I believe that is uh, very vital and needful in the world in which we live. First of all, notice he is separated from the world. Notice his delight, blessed, literally very happy, fortunate, delighted is the man. May I remind us, often believers go around, now I don't know if you've lived on a farm, if you've seen a mule or not, but uh, many say that uh, uh, Christians, even Christians, go, out, go around with their face hanging out like a mule, uh, whatever that means. It means with that sad uh, uh, face, that sad expression, that attitude. Some, says, some say that we, as Christians, oftentimes look like we've been vaccinated with pickle juice, with that long face. But the happy Christian, the one that will impact lives for the Lord Jesus Christ, are not just those that are positive thinkers, We've heard that many times. Uh, it's uh, some of the positive thinker advocates tell us that all we need to do is be happy and just be positive. Be happy and just be positive. I could name you a preacher out in Texas that that is his philosophy. Just be positive and be happy. It's the Norman Vincent Peale approach that, uh, in fact, one preacher a number of years ago in preaching the Beatitudes called it the Be Happy Attitudes. And uh, the mindset is we can just be happy, live uh, good and be happy, and everything is okay. But positive thinking will not bring happiness. Who is that delighted Christian? His delight. But notice the direction. Blessed, happy, delighted is that man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. May I point out two or three things about this happy Christian, this Christian that's beyond the level of mediocrity, this uh, Christian that has an attitude of serving the Lord. Be the blessed, happy, delighted man is that one that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. So first thing we see is his godly walk, his godly walk. Walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. In fact, in First John chapter 2 and verse 15, the scripture admonishes us, love not the world. The extraordinary Christian, the Christian living beyond mediocrity, does not uh, go to places that the world goes. The uh, Christian that's beyond the realm of mediocrity, the extraordinary Christian, does not listen to nor seek the advice of the lost world. The word counsel there has the idea of directions, advice, recommendations. 
I'm always amazed and saddened also to find that many, if not most Christians, when it comes down to a crossroad in life, when it comes down to a catastrophic event in life, when it comes to uh, serious decision-making in life, when it comes to uh, that uh, search for a real answer, uh, the sad thing is, and the thing that uh, always shocks me, is the number of Christians that will go to every source that the world has to offer for advice and direction and insight and counsel as to what ought to be done. The Scripture says here that he walketh not in the counsel, the direction, the advice, the conclusion, of the world. Where do you seek advice? Where do you go for advice? Is it from a secular counselor? Is it a so-called Christian counselor that will add a verse of uh, Scripture and pray and then give the uh, Freud methodology or the uh, Skinner methodology of what to do and how to think and how to respond. There are multitudes today that uh, will not go back to the Word and seek God uh, for an answer and seek for wisdom from Holy God as to what we ought to do. That's the source, that's the counsel, that's the direction for a, an extraordinary Christian if we're going to live beyond the realm of mediocrity. May I remind us, we're in the world, but not of the world. The happy, the extraordinary Christian does not begin with the power of positive thinking, but with the power of negative thinking. What I should not do, where I should not go, where I should not be, what I should not say, etc., etc., and you understand. The happy Christian is happy, is delighted, goes beyond the realm of mediocrity. He's extraordinary because of the things he avoids, the places that he avoids, the uh, friends uh, or the people that he avoids. The extraordinary Christian is to be different from the world, different from what the world says and does. Notice not only his godly walk, but his godly witness. Notice the scripture says, nor standeth in the way of sinners. The word way means bent. Leaning, direction, path. May I remind us, nor standeth in the way, the bent, the leaning, the directioning, the direction of the lost world. He standeth not in the way of sinners, the pathway, the bent, the direction of a lost person. Jesus was a friend of the publicans and sinners. He reached out to them with the gospel, but he did not linger with them. He did not remain with them. He did not allow them to impact him in what his mission was in sharing the good news of the gospel. There are multitudes today that will linger with, hang out with, stay with. Uh, make intimate friendships with those that are in the world, those that the Scripture would refer to as sinners. Now listen very carefully and keep in mind, we're all sinners. Some are sinners saved by grace. Others are sinners still living in that sinful old man, old nature lifestyle. And so that's what the Scripture is talking about. May I remind us, we need to be the extraordinary Christian. We need to go beyond mediocrity. We need to do more than just uh, when in doubt, Charlie out. We need to always be on the lookout and the recognition of what pleases the Lord. And we need not hang out with and go with and walk around with and witness uh, and uh, be a witness to the world in relationship to who we have as friends. My mother used to use the term birds of a feather flock together. You ever heard that old saying? <laughs> You know, it's amazing what we grow up hearing and not realizing the impact that it has on our lives. My wife can tell you that so, so often with our boys now in their adulthood, with families of their own, will make statements uh, in relationship to why they do something and what they do and some of the sayings. And uh, she uh, kind of uh, laughs sometimes. She said, uh, where did you get that from? Uh, they are not realizing that they grew up hearing it and uh, they grew up with that being an impact on their lives and they grew up with that uh, being the impression that mom or dad makes in their lives and as a result of that, that is part and parcel of their lifestyle and living. May I remind us, Lot lingered in Sodom 
as a result of Lot's lingering in Sodom. He lost his family. He lost his fortune. He lost his future as a result of where he lingered. And I could stand here the balance of the time and share with you illustration after illustration after illustration of those that uh, got into deep, deep, deep moral, ethical, or uh, 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 problems in relationship to that which is right and that which is wrong as a result of those that they would hang out with and stay with and finally ran with. There's a individual that has the video series uh, that uh, talks about how he uh, was sentenced to his title, title of uh, his uh, is twice pardoned uh, because he uh, uh, got saved in prison uh, and then after he was saved in prison later he got a full pardon from the governor but it was as a result of being with a bunch of boys that said let's go for a ride they went for a ride and he did not realize when one said let's pull over here at the convenience store want to go in and get a pack of cigarettes that he went in and with a pistol robbed the store as a result of that, by lingering with the wrong crowd, with the wrong group, all of them were sentenced to 15 to 20 years in prison. May I remind us, we need not linger with. We need to recognize and realize that it's okay to go out in the world, to be in the world. We're of the world, but not of the, we're in the world, but not of the world. Our responsibility is to go out and preach the gospel, that is, uh, share the good news, the gospel, with everybody. But it doesn't mean that we're to take on their lifestyle. One person said on one occasion when, as a preacher, he was seen coming out of a bar and a lounge, and he said, well, I was just in there witnessing. And the philosophy is, whether you go into the hog pen to get the hog's business, no, you wouldn't do that. But yet as a result of the mindset and the philosophy that somehow, some way, I can go where they go, and it's okay because I'm saved, and I simply want to reach them with the gospel, we don't do that. That's not the appropriate lifestyle for a Christian. The believer will never influence the world if the influence of the world is in him influencing his life in the way that he dresses, the way that he talks, the way that he places that he goes. Separate yourself from the world and be an extraordinary Christian, living beyond mediocrity, his godly walk, his godly witness, but notice also his godly wisdom. The scripture says, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. The word sit there means to locate, to remain with, to stay, to become stable, to, if you please, make a home there. Of the scornful, the word scornful means the mockers, those that make fun of, make light of, anything that's Christian or anything that's godly, anything that's spiritual. I've got an article here of a few years back, but I believe it still illustrates as well today. It's from the news website, World Net Daily. Fox News is threatening to sue a prominent evangelical minister in the ex-homosexual movement who engaged in a volatile exchange over biblical morality on the top-rated television program, The O'Reilly Factor. Stephen Bennett who says he left his homosexual lifestyle nearly 11 years ago, has distributed 60-minute audio tape programs called The O'Reilly Shocker, in which he responds to the host Bill O'Reilly for characterizing of the people that take the Bible literally as religious fanatics. The Bill O'Reilly Show program, is a, Bill O'Reilly is a uh, Roman Catholic, and he called Bennett a, quote, religious fanatic who wants to deny other people their rights, end quote, and suggested that the minister wanted all gays to go to hell. I've been accused of that. He's a libertarian who relishes the fact that he doesn't care what you talk about, but we have to have the right free speech, right of free speech, Bennett said to O'Reilly. Yet when it comes to me not speaking out, never saying anything nasty about anybody, but just addressing the issues, he does everything possible to silence me, the preacher said. And that's what I'm talking about, and that's what the Scripture's talking about, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. There are those in society that will laugh at, mock, and make fun of you and me, whether it's to our face or to our back, in relationship to our spiritual stand and honoring God. 
Back a number of years ago when I was confronting the city council with their law that was about to be passed that would allow liquor by the drink on a Sunday. It was the first time that it was taking place in Duval County. I stood before the city council a half dozen times and challenged that on the basis of my research that every county, every city across the nation that had ever done that, the cost of the taxpayers to take care of those that became homeless and without food or had fatherless homes as a result of it, as a result of becoming coming alcoholics and spending every dime of money that came into the home for some booze to drink, I presented it on that basis. So the local newspaper then at the time was a weekly paper called the Mandarin News. Called me the headlines, Dr. Gene Youngblood, a Bible thumper. And they made a whole to-do about that in that one full front page. Some of the things was right disparaging. Some of the things were absolutely factual because I did not want to. They said I was just beating people over the head with the Bible. And uh, they went on to go to an extraneous level to try to demean and to in some way disparage what I was trying to say. And I read the article, and each time I'd read the article, I'd get a little, um, what's the best term for that? Bent out of shape. <laughs> what the scripture called holy anger. Uh, Bent out of shape. By the way, you know, the wrath of God, W-R-A-T-H, is the Greek word thumos, means white hot anger. God gets bent out of shape. And uh, uh, yet as Christians, somehow, some way, there's a philosophy that Christians don't never get angry about anything. We need to have holy, righteous indignation and anger. And so after reading it several times and determining uh, what they were attempting to do, I simply, and some of you have heard me share the story, but it fits here, uh, I simply called them and challenged them on some of those points, and I said, you've got two options, either a full retraction, or I'm going to sue your pants off, or the other option would be, I will write an article, and for the full pages you printed trying to demean me, I'll write a full article with all my data, all my statistical gathering, and all of the evidence to prove what I've said is correct, and you print it without any editorial privilege. They said, write the article and send it. I didn't believe them. I wrote the article and sent it. And so the following week, the full front page was my uh, retort to what they had said in relationship to that. I believe God would have us to stand against those that stand against God and against God's Word and against the moral, ethical truths of the Word of God. We ought not to be in the position where we sit with, we allow the scorners to take the uh, upper hand. Those that are in the sodomite community across the nation today, their philosophy is we can demean you, we can call you anything we want to, and you little Christian, you need to be quiet, you need to sit down and be seen and never heard. That's simply not in accord with the Scripture. There's nothing in the Scripture that says that we're supposed, as Christians, supposed to be doormats. We're to speak the truth, the Scripture says, in love. Not in hate, but in love. And as a result of that, when the uh, lie is confronted, when the immorality is confronted, when the wayward lifestyle is confronted, when everything that's in conflict with the Scripture is confronted, there's the attitude and the mindset, you just don't love people. But that's not what the Scripture is talking about here. May I remind us, his godly wisdom, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Even your co-workers and family and friends, we need to understand and recognize that we need to be where God would have us to be, to love him and to serve him and to stand and not to be with, staying with, located with, remaining in the seat or the place where the scornful, those that mock and make fun of, the Word of God, and spiritual things. May I remind us, the extraordinary Christian, the Christian living beyond the level of mediocrity, has the wisdom and discernment he knows not to listen to or to linger with or to locate with those in the lost world and identified with lostness in society. How in the world can be, we be salt and light in a darkened, decaying world if we look like, act like, talk like, and go the same places that the lost world goes and does. It's an impossibility. One of the major problems in Christendom today is that most Christians look like, act like, talk like the world, and you can't tell the difference other than on Sunday. You know, on Sunday, most of the time, those that fall into that level of mediocrity and those that are willing to be seated with the scornful, etc., the major difference is the philosophy is you ought to come to preach or less act safe because today's Sunday, <laughs> and that ought not to be it at all. That should be the lifestyle and the attitude and the mindset of the child of God seven days a week. Not only if we're going to live beyond mediocrity 
be the extraordinary Christian. He is separated from the world. And secondly, he is saturated in the world, in the word. He is saturated in the world. Notice the scripture says his delight, but his delight, notice the word but, it's a contrast, it's a different direction, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. His delight. My question I made for myself here to ask the question, what rings your bell? You've heard that term. Uh, what is it that excites you most? What is it that causes you to get really, really excited about something? That, is it Star Wars? <laughs> I'm always amazed at the profit margin of the Hollywood elitist with movies like that. Um, I've had uh, those that have gotten caught up in being Trekkies, Star Trek, down through the years. Uh, I've had those that can tell you the name of every series, the characters in each one of them, who, what, when, and where, et cetera, et cetera. I've never understood that. Never understood that. There are those that can tell you about the series that comes on, some of the series comes on television as the stomach churns and the others like that. They can tell you who the, they can tell you who the players are and uh, who got killed and when they got killed and when they're going to die and what happened, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they don't get excited about the Word of God. The thing that ought to excite and ought to make delightful of our hearts for the child of God is the Word of God. Being in the Word, studying the Word, allowing the Word of God to permeate our lives and to motivate our footsteps and to give conviction and commitment in our, our lives that we'd be all that God will have us to be. Most believers, most of us, notice I said us, most of us will never fully understand and recognize what God can really do in one person that's sold out for Jesus Christ. That's what God's looking for in your life and mine. To be sold out and surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ that we're willing to do what he says do, go where he says go, be what he wants us to be. And the only way we'll ever know that answer is in the Word, through the Word, by the Word. For his delight, that means joy, is in the law of the Lord. That's the Bible. The believer's Living that's going to live above the level of mediocrity and be beyond mediocrity. The extraordinary Christian finds his joy, his happiness, his pleasure, his delight in the Word of God. There's no greater joy than to be able to study the Word and dig under the rocks and see what the Word says and allow that Word then to basically as I've used the term, ring our bell. Bring that uh, sense of challenge and excitement and joy in seeing what the Word says and then applying that in our lives. Every message I've ever prepared, every uh, text that I've ever examined, every word that I've ever looked at in the Scripture, I look at it on the basis, how can this apply first to me and then to others, and then I do the word study, then I do the outline, then I say, as uh, a preacher of old suggested a number of years ago, he's with the Lord now, he said, as I prepare my outline, as I do my word study, I look at it then when it's finalized, and I pray over each word and say, God, is this what you want me to say? God, is this how you'd like for me to say it? God, is there anything you'd like for me to add, change, or delete? Let me speak it with power and authority from on high. That ought to be the mindset and the heartbeat of the child of God. The pure delight and the pleasure is in the Word. Not in the world, but in the Word. If you love the Lord... You'll love his word. David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalms 119 and verse 11. May I remind us, Dr. Lockyer, and I'll not go into the full details, but Dr. Herbert Lockyer, as I've said many times, his philosophy was and his recommendation to me and his advice was, Know the word. Know the word. Know this word. Do you enjoy reading the Bible? Do you enjoy studying it? I've heard people say, well, preacher, you know, I like to read the Bible more, but I just don't understand Revelation. Get out of Revelation. Get in John. <laughs> you know, I, I, I really want to study the Word, but I just don't understand the King James. Read it, and God will help you to even pronounce those four-cylinder words. <laughs> As you study the Old Testament, by the way, I've said many times, those mamas, evidently hated those sons 
<laughs> you can tell that by the names they gave them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sometimes I have to analyze the word and say, Lord, it could be pronounced this way or this way. I'm going to take the middle road and pronounce it this way. One of them's got to be right. <laughs> But do we meditate on the Word? Do we study the Word? Do we allow the Word to permeate our hearts and our lives? Notice, not only do we see His delight, but notice His diligence. And in His law doth He meditate day and night. You know what that means? It means the extraordinary Christian, the Christian living beyond mediocrity, isn't satisfied just to read the Word, but he wants to meditate upon it. Read it and reread it, read it and ponder it, and then reread it, read it and ponder it, and then reread it. That's meditating on the Word. That's taking the Word and looking at it and saying, Lord, what are you saying in this text? Now, there's some of the text and some of the words, some of the uh, units of thought that you can look at and read 400 times and pray about it until Jesus comes, and it's still not fully discernible. It's an impossibility to know 100% of all that God says in his word. Why is that so? Because God's God. And as a result of that, we're looking at, as I teach in hermeneutics, we're looking at a text, a scripture, that's been given 2,000, 4,000 years ago in the culture and the context and the setting of that era. And we're trying to interpret it based on 21st century Western civilization. And many times it's not only uh, difficult, but many times it's impossible to get the full depth of what God's word is saying. You want to know about Jesus? Look at the 21 chapters of John. Read it and reread it. And you'll find that the, uh, John says even all of the libraries in all of the world will not be sufficient to say all that could be said or written about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how exhaustive it is on studying Christology about who is Jesus Christ. His diligence is in the law, and uh, doth, there doth he meditate day and night. In fact, in Joshua chapter 1, you need not turn to it. Let me share that. Joshua chapter 1, verse 7, 8, and 9. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee, turn not to the right hand nor to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. You know what the scripture is saying? Cut it down the middle. Don't turn to the left. Don't turn to the right. Study the word of God and be obedient to what it says, following it without bending and without error. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all, not some, but all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, be the, neither thou be dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Now there are a lot of folks that will preach and teach uh, the prosperity gospel. There are a lot of people that will say, you know, if you really are where God wants you, if you're really doing what God wants you to do, he's going to make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. You'll never get sick. You'll never be in the hospital. You'll never die. You'll always have money in your pocket, and you'll always be prosperous. That's not what this scripture is talking about in this text, nor is it what is being talked about in the Joshua text. The word there, prosper, is talking about uhodos. It means having a good journey. It means to be uh, successful in what God has called and overseen what you're doing, that you will be all that God would have you to be in the journey in life. That's verifiable, by the way, in the third John, the second verse. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prosperous. It's not talking about anything in relationship to prosperity by way of greenbacks as some of these characters, can I be polite? on television, preach and say. has nothing to do with that. In the context in Third John, in the context in Joshua chapter 1, in the context in Psalms chapter 1, it's talking about being successful in being, doing what God has called you to do in the journey that he's placed our feet upon. Now, you know, some of the things might happen in your life and mine that we are not necessarily delighted to take place. Some things might be hitting the potholes in the road and the difficulties and the bends in the road and the uh, roadblocks that we will face. But as we serve God and keep on keeping on in his word, he has guaranteed, he's absolutely assured us that ultimately there will be victory because he's the one that's doing the guiding and directing in our lives. The diligence, his diligence. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Listen very carefully. The extraordinary Christian the one that's living beyond mediocrity, 
is not uh, careless in the reading of the word, but a close reader of the word. Notice also his dedication in that verse. Day and night. Pretty powerful statement. Habitual Bible study. Not hit and miss. Not two or three minutes a day. Not two or three times a week. But day and night. Now that doesn't mean we read the Bible and never sleep. That's not what it's saying. But it's talking about it needs to be done on a continuum. A basis of dedication. Most will have a time when you sit down and eat breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Most will want to sit down and watch Fox News at 6 o'clock. Amen. <laughs> Not CNN. You know, the uh, those that bash Christ and so forth and so on, all of them got where they do that anymore. But you have a set time for things. There's some medications that I need to take, and there's a set time I need to take it. If we simply prescribe for ourselves the, uh, uh, if you please, the remedy, the Rx, the prescription for living a life beyond mediocrity and being the extraordinary Christian, that Rx, that prescription is staying in the Word. Day and night, being in the Word, studying the Word, allowing the Word. And I'm not talking about reading John 3.16 here, and I wonder what comes in John 3, 1 through 15. I wonder what happens in John 3, uh, chapter 1, um, John chapter 3, verses 16 through 36. I wonder what's there. I wonder what it means. It's reading the unit of thought, the fullness of the totality of what the Scripture says, and seeing what God says to us, reading something in the Old Testament and the New Testament on a daily basis, reading through the Scripture as often as possible, and letting God direct our hearts and our lives through the Word, the dedication, day and night, constantly, continually feeding on the Word. The extraordinary Christian, the Christian that's living beyond mediocrity, is influenced not by the counsel of the ungodly, but by the constant, continual, conscious, deliberate study of the Word of God. So the question must be asked of each of us. Are you an ordinary Christian or are you an extraordinary Christian? Are you living in mediocrity or beyond uh, mediocrity? Not only do we see he is separated from the world, he's saturated in the Word, but in that third verse, he is strengthened by the word. Notice verse 3. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. His distinction is found. And there's about four portions of that distinction. First of all, his prominence, his permanence, his productivity, and his perpetuity. I want you to notice his prominence. Like a tree. Most will read right over that and perhaps not think as I think. Uh, I like beautiful, stately bay trees, magnolia trees, when they're full grown, 25, 35 feet high. And at the appropriate season, the gigantic, beautiful white blossoms on those uh, magnolia trees. And what is it that you see as you drive by any place where there's a magnolia tree? Or on the campus of the property where there's a magnolia tree? The first thing you see, that tree is standing tall and stately. Its prominence is very visible. It's tall, it's recognizable, it's alive, it's healthy, it's green, it's waving, can be seen stately and standing for some distance across away. And the scripture's talking about the Christian the extraordinary Christian, the one that's living beyond mediocrity, his prominence is like a tree. Alive, well, standing tall, not fearful, not cowardice, not uh, turning and running when uh, there's a difficulty, not being fearful to take a stand for truth, not being uh, uh, willing, not willing to just simply be silent and not be heard, but just simply to sit in the corner and be the good little boy as the world would have Christians to be today. His prominence and his permanence planted, not vacillating. The roots go down deep, not uh, floating from place to place. Unmovable, the Scripture's talking about, not fickled, not changing the mind, but standing stable daily. That's a tall order, isn't it? It's a difficult task, isn't it? It's not an impossibility, though. And the key to it is we start where we are today and make a conscious, deliberate decision that each day we're going to be more like the tree that's planted by the rivers of water. May I remind us, we need to understand there's the need for the prominence and the permanence in the life of the child of God that we stand and be seen and heard in a darkened, decaying society in which we're living in. 
notice his productivity, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. What is that saying? That tree that's planted by the rivers of water, that's planted, that has deep roots. Because of those deep roots and that stability, he brings forth fruit in his season. Uh, you take a tree that doesn't produce, if it's a banana tree, if it's an orange tree, if it's an apple tree, there's something wrong if it's not producing fruit. Generally speaking, it's because the roots have not gone down deep enough to find the nutrients in the soil and the fertilizer and the uh, moisture that's needed to produce the fruit. And so also for the child of God, for the Christian that's not uh, living beyond the realm of mediocrity, the Christian that's not living the extraordinary Christian life, the roots have not gone deep enough in the Word that it can come through us and produce fruit in our lives. An orange tree is going to produce an orange. An apple tree will produce an apple. A Christian ought to produce the fruit, which is another Christian, in reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our responsibility, and that's the joy that we have in serving the Lord. We're talking about his distinction. It shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. We see his prominence and his permanence, his productivity. May I remind us, the tree gleans its nutrients from the soil and gathers the water and reproduces. So also the extraordinary Christian, the Christian that's living beyond the realm of mediocrity, ought to produce other believers. Now, you don't do that by going out on the street corner and getting your white sheet and cutting out the eye holes and standing there passing out tracks all day. <laughs> it's, uh, that's not what the Scripture's talking about. But conversely, it's while going, you disciple. Every place we go, everybody we see, every opportunity where God opens the door is shared the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Find some way, something that we can enter a conversation that will point to Jesus Christ and the need for them to know him and to know him personally. Then we see his, as I call it, his perpetuity. His leaf also shall not wither. The extraordinary Christian, the Christian living beyond the realm of mediocrity, is not diverted or delayed or destroyed by the uh, uh, conditions around him. He's alive for the Lord, and he works and he walks and he witnesses in serving the Lordship of Jesus Christ. When we study the Word and meditate on the Word, there should be no drought in the believer's life. Don't fret. Don't dismay. Don't be discouraged. Don't feel as though it is hopeless and helpless because of the economic state in America, because of the political condition in America, because of the uh, social and ethical and moral decline in America. As Christians, we keep on keeping on doing what God's called us to do, his distinction. And finally, I want us to notice in that third verse also, his destiny, his destiny. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper, literally shall have a good journey, shall be successful to the degree that God's called us to be. This doesn't mean that he will not, have the, this Christian will not have problems. This doesn't mean that there will not be difficulties. This doesn't mean that somehow, some way, we've got to retract what we've done and discontinue what we're doing in serving in submission and lordship, to the lordship of Jesus Christ. But there's the promise, the end result that we find in the Scripture. The Scripture says, and whatsoever he doeth, whatsoever in the context of the instructions given. It doesn't mean just go anywhere you, any place you want to go. You do anything you want to do, and God says, man, whatever I do, I can just wake up, open my eyes, and go out and just do whatever I want to, and God's promised it's going to prosper. It's not what the Scripture's saying at all. Not at all. Farthest thing from that. But it does mean that God has promised that the end result will be that which pleases him. In fact, in Psalms 92, verse 12, 13, and 14, I'll read these words. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. It's a pretty powerful statement as to God's promise and commitment to each of us beyond mediocrity. Are you an extraordinary Christian? 
Would you like to be? Would you like to start being an extraordinary Christian, living beyond mediocrity? Would you like to know that day by day and moment by moment, you're doing what God's called you to do? You're where God wants you to be. Well, this could be the very first day of the rest of your life. First and foremost, there's a need to know Jesus Christ personally as Lord and Savior. The only way we can think about being on the journey of living beyond mediocrity as the